Second Samuel chapter 24, and in First Chronicles chapter 21, we read that King David was stirred up by Satan. He was influenced by him. He was influenced so that he foolishly gave an order to his commanders to go out through the land and to count the people of his kingdom. Seems that he was particularly interested in those who were skilled in battle. In his pride, he forgot that whatever number of people that he ruled, whatever the size of his army, the blessing, the blessing, the victory, comes from the Lord, not from himself. So after the counting was completed, David realized what he had done. He had sinned against the Lord, and so he cried out to him for forgiveness. But as we know, our decisions bring consequences. And so for three days, a plague fell upon the land, and 70,000 men died. They died as an angel stretched out his hand, stretched it out against the people. And David saw that angel by the threshing floor of a man named Arana, a Gentile who was also known as Ornan. This man owned a piece of ground on the same area where Abraham had offered up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. The same ground that one day David's son Solomon would build a temple. But on that day, the day that David saw that angel, that place was an area for extracting grain from straw. It was a place that separated the wheat from the chaff. It was farmland. And so David cried out to the Lord in that place. And he said, I'm the one who has sinned against you. Not these sheep, not my people. So let thy hand be against me. Let it be against my house. And so the Lord, through the prophet Gad, told David to offer a sacrifice. Offer a sacrifice on the threshing floor of Arana. So David offered to buy that place. He offered to give money to Arana. Arana offered to give it to him for free. In fact, he offered to give him his oxen for the sacrifice. He offered to give him his farming implements for the fire on the altar. That man was willing to give everything he had, everything that related to his entire occupation for David, for the Lord. But David answered him this way. He said, no, for I will surely buy it from you. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. True sacrifice. True repentance. True worship. True obedience to the Lord will cost us something. And that is a truth that we find throughout the Bible and should be obvious to us, but somehow we think, as those who belong to the Lord, that it doesn't apply to us. Well, it was certainly true of our Savior, wasn't it? His obedience cost him his life. Cost him everything. We're told he was a man of sorrows. He was a man in pain, we're told in Isaiah 53. A man who suffered as he bore our sins in his body on the cross. Hasn't he left us an example? Our obedience will cost us something. And as Peter is writing to those believers who were scattered throughout Asia Minor, he is writing to men and women who were suffering for Christ. Their faith 
had cost them everything. They were beginning to feel the persecution that was escalating from their friends, from their neighbors, from their family, from the Roman government. But even though they were under great pressure because of their immediate situation, Peter reminds them to keep the struggles in perspective. To remember the great mercy that God has shown to them that before the foundation of the world, he chose them to be his possession. They belong to God. And through the death of his son, he has saved them from an eternity of pain and suffering. And through the resurrection of Christ, we are guaranteed a place in heaven that we will be with him forever. This is a salvation, Peter says, that is ready to be revealed to you. Ready at any moment. So, despite your suffering, Peter tells them in verse 6 of First Peter chapter 1, in this in all that God has done for you, in all that he continues to do in you, in all all that awaits you in heaven for eternity, shouldn't you always have joy in your heart? That's a good question, isn't it? Over and over again in the Psalms, Even in the midst of trouble, the psalmist reminds us, Thou hast put gladness in my heart, he says in Psalm 4. I will take refuge in you. Those who take refuge in you will find gladness. Let them sing for joy, he says in Psalm 5. Delight yourself in the Lord, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 37. So Peter says in verse 6, you are to greatly rejoice in your salvation. Galiao, you are continue to, you to continue to overflow with joy and praise to your God. You're to be exceedingly glad. Not because of your circumstances. And not according to your feelings or your emotions. They change every day. For some of us, they change every hour of every day. But he says, you are to rejoice because of something else. You're to rejoice because of your relationship with Christ. You are to rejoice because of your relationship with the God of the universe. Don't you know, Peter says, that even heaven rejoices at your salvation. We're told that in Luke chapter 15, aren't we? It says, we were lost, we've been found. And so God rejoices over us. Angels rejoice. Well, shouldn't we we be rejoicing as well? Philippians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul tells us, rejoice always. Rejoice all the time. But that's not always the way it is in our lives, is it? Life can be difficult. The circumstances can be overwhelming. And sometimes even our sin and our failures can take away the joy of our salvation. But Peter would have us begin to realign our thinking. He would begin to have us develop a different perspective, to set our affections, to set our our minds on Christ, our hope in him. Because no matter what happens, we are secure in him. So we can rejoice as we anticipate the deliverance that will come to us. Even though, he says in verse 6, even though for now, at this time, even though your suffering is real, 
It is only for a short while, he says. Aligos. It is only for a short measure of time. A suffering is limited by time. It has a beginning. Trouble has a beginning. It also has an end. It's momentary. We're told that in 2 Corinthians 4.17. Why? Because Paul says it is momentary in light of your eternity. Weeping may last for the night, we're told in Psalm 30, verse 15. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. And our morning, our daylight, which will never end, is about to come. So we can rejoice. That's the perspective Peter wants us to have. So he says in verse 6, if if it is necessary, Dan, if it is required of you as a follower of Christ to be bound in the chains of affliction, If you are called upon to suffer for his name in order to chasten you, in order to humble you, in order to develop the character of Christ in you, in order that you might stand for him against the enemy, if that is where you are, he says, and you have been distressed, and you are, you're full of sorrow. Because of these various trials, these poikilois mirasmois, these trials and afflictions that come in all shapes and sizes. Is that where you are? Peter says, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. Why? Because God is ever faithful. We're told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He remains true in every situation in our life. And what does that verse say? It says that he will not allow us to be destroyed by those trials, but he will provide the way through them. He will help us to endure, to endure with joy, and to emerge victoriously. So why shouldn't we rejoice? Well, Peter says, these trials also have another purpose in your life. He says, they, they're there to display your faith. They show you, and they show those around you, that your faith is real. They give the proof, evidence of your faith. Doikimion in Greek. It's a term used in metallurgy. Peter says our faith is like valuable metal. It's like valuable metal that has been liquefied in the fire of difficulties. We know what that's like. And those difficulties do something. Peter says they reveal the quality of our faith. They show us whether we have faith at all. So these trials come upon us, and and like fire, they come like fire, and they burn off what's not real. They burn off what's not pure. They burn off what is not of Christ. So rejoice, Peter says, because what will be left in you has eternal value. It is more precious, he says, more valuable than gold, which is also tried in the fire, but it is perishable. Someday it'll fade away, even though it's tested by fire. But our faith, when it is tested, oh, there's a different result there. We're tested by persecution. We're tested by sorrow. But when that faith is found to be pure, then Peter says it is more valuable than gold because gold fades away. Our faith lasts forever. Forever. 
So the testing of our faith through the difficulties, as it stands the test of time, takes us into eternity. So we grieve, but yet at the same time we find joy in what God is doing in us. Isn't that amazing? So through the tears, we can praise him as we entrust ourselves to our God, as we trust in his wisdom, in what he is doing, what he allows to come into our lives. And we can rejoice because of this, Peter says. Because of the result. What result? Verse 7. He says that your proven faith may be found, harisko, may be regarded by God. How? He says, with joy. God rejoices as he looks at us and as he refines us as he shapes us, as he conforms us to the image of his son, and in the end, the result will be words of praise from God. And it will be glory as we share in the glory of his son. And it will be honor as we receive the riches of heaven. That's what trials do. All the way into eternity. At the revelation, at the apocalypsis, at the unveiling of Jesus Christ from heaven in all his glory. Then we will hear those words. Those words recorded in Matthew chapter 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into what? The joy of your Lord. God rejoices over us. So, Peter would ask, what should we do? What should we do now? 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, we must, we must walk through this world and we must live our lives. Ha! It says, by faith in Christ by our confidence in him, by our belief in the truth of his word. And so we cannot walk through this world by sight, it says, by the things around us that appear to be true, but they are lies. So, we must fix our hope on him as we anticipate, as we long for his return. And though you have not seen him, Peter says in verse 8, you're blessed. You're blessed beyond measure. Do you know that? John chapter 20 tells us why. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said this to all of them, including Peter. Since you have seen me risen from the dead, You have believed in me. But blessed are those who have not seen me. And yet, they have believed. So we are blessed. The people that Peter was writing to were blessed. Why? Peter says in verse 8, Because you love him. Agapete, you love Christ with all your heart. You are willing to sacrifice yourself for him, to him, to you. He is precious. And yet, you have never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you do see him in the scriptures. You hear his voice as he speaks to you through his word as he fills your heart with himself. And that is all by faith. By faith. A faith that he has put in us. You believe in him. Pistuo, you have entrusted yourselves to him. 
And so, Peter says, you greatly rejoice. You exalt him. You magnify him. By your words, by your lives, living with joy, with kara, with delight, inexpressible, ana, aneklaletos, with joy. That goes beyond our ability to express adequately. All of our praise falls short of the one that we adore. And this joy, Peter says, is full of doxa. It's full of glory. It is, it is filled with heavenly praise as the Spirit of God leads us to worship Him, to glorify Him. Obtaining this, komizo menoi, receiving now, receiving now the outcome. The telos, the fulfillment of your faith. We don't have to wait. Peter says it's now. The culmination of your faith is this. He says the salvation, the sodaria, the deliverance of your souls, your suke, your breath, your life. We can know now that we are on our way to glory, to heaven. Is there anything more important than that in this world? The salvation of our soul? So, Peter says, rejoice in the joy of your salvation. Now, as to the salvation, perhaps... Perhaps you really don't understand how blessed you are. Peter says in verse 10, the prophets of the Old Testament who prophesied, they spoke for God. They testified of the grace of the salvation that would come to you. They were speaking to you. And so they made careful search, Peter says. Exeteo. They diligently search search the scriptures, comparing the prophecies that they had been given by God with prophecies that other prophets had been given. And so they made inquiry, he says, exer arano, they, they examined these words. They prayed, seeking to know, to understand what the plan of God would would be how how would it unfold? How would our deliverance come about? But Peter says, even though these were prophets of God and had been given words from him, still God withheld a complete knowledge of what would happen. It was a mystery to them. They didn't understand. You know, they didn't understand everything that they spoke about. And they were puzzled by it. He didn't understand how there could be a salvation for them, for their people, and yet a salvation for the, for the nations, for the Gentiles. There was an invitation by God for everyone to come and to drink of the water of life. A Messiah who would suffer, who would die, and yet who would triumph, who would reign forever. They wanted to know what kind of a person this would be, this prophet, this priest, this king. And they wanted to understand the time, Peter says, the kairos, the time period. When would all this happen? When would it happen? As the Spirit of God within them, as says the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, he made it clear that when he predicted, when he testified to this, to the sufferings of Christ. He testified to his rejection, to his torture, to his crucifixion, to his death. 
And Peter says in verse 11, the Spirit of God also gave them a glimpse of the glories that were to follow his resurrection, his majesty in heaven, his return to earth, his everlasting kingdom. It's all there. Peter says it's all there in the Old Testament and it all speaks of Christ. But they just didn't know how it all fit together. But, he says, it was revealed to them, apocalypto, it was unveiled to them by God, verse 12, that they were not just serving themselves. Their ministry was not just for their people. The prophecies were not just for them. But, he says, they were also serving you. They were serving us in these things. I see him. The prophet Balaam said in Numbers chapter 24. But not now. I behold him, he said. But he's not near. Many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see. But they didn't see it, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13. They desired to hear what you hear, and yet they did not hear it. But now, since Christ has come, we know what the Old Testament prophets longed to know. That Christ is the fulfillment of their prophecies. They prophesied of him. And they prophesied of him for us, for our benefit. Yet, they lived in hope, didn't they? They lived in hope of his coming, just like we live in hope of his return. All of these things which the the Old Testament prophets saw, Peter says, now, now they have been announced to you and declared through those apostles and prophets who have preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ among you. This is a message that has been given by the Holy Spirit who has been sent from heaven, sent to testify of Christ, to testify of salvation through his blood. And these are things, Peter says, that angels long to look into. Epithomio. They have this strong desire to understand salvation. Paracupto in Greek. They, they bend down as if trying to get a better perspective on what it means to be forgiven. They don't understand. Well, how could they? No, they, they see a world that we don't see. Spirit world. They stand before a holy God, yet they've never sinned. They've never experienced the mercy, the grace of a God who loves us despite our sin, who loves us and gives us salvation when we deserve his wrath. So they don't understand. Because ever since they were created, what have they done? They have served God in perfect obedience. So they long to understand these things. They long to understand our salvation. So, we might ask ourselves, why do they want to know these things? Why do they want to understand them? Well, I think we might ask ourselves, why were they created in the first place? Why were they created? To worship God? To serve Him? To glorify Him forever, day and night? So, perhaps, if they could just understand 
what it means to be saved, what it means to be forgiven, if they could understand the grace of God, His mercy more fully, then perhaps they could give Him more glory and worship Him in an even more perfect way. Wow. Is that how we value our salvation? Is that how we live our lives? To give Him even more glory? Is that what we long for? Angels long to give Him more glory. Do we? Maybe we need to return to the threshing floor with David. Maybe we need to to separate the wheat from the chaff in our lives. And maybe we need to offer a sacrifice. Sacrifice of praise. Praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving Him glory. Thanking Him for the wonder of our salvation, the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.